Welcome to this episode of DIY3DTech.com. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the IceSL Forge. Uh, when I did the introductory to IceSL, I shared that there are really a couple components. One is the slicer, uh, IceSL slicer, and then the other is IceSL Forge, which includes the slicer, as you see over here, but it also includes a scripting window, which you see over at, on the left, as well as the near left at the bottom, a console window. So when you start up the forge, what you'll notice is it puts in some cute little code where it diffs a sphere from a cube, and this is the kind of interesting object you get. So what we're gonna do in this episode is take a look at some examples of how you can use scripting, and, and the scripting is pretty straightforward. However, before we get there, and I'll try to spit this out, is why would we want to do this? Well, the piece is it, when you deal programmatically with objects, you deal in very explicit terms. Now, I'm not trying to take anything away from Fusion 360, Tinkercad. I love all those things, and, and there's a place for graphical design. But one of the things to keep in mind when you're working in Tinkercad or Fusion 360, what's happening? It's doing all this code for you in the background. And also, when you go and you do the slicer, what happens? it creates G code. So the world runs on code. This is where Eric and Drayson famously said the world is going to be eaten by software. So this allows you very specific means to accomplish a task. And for the hobbyist that's just wanting to print low poly objects or just kind of mess around, probably not the right thing. However, if you're running a service bureau and you need to get the most parts per square inch of bed to optimize your your production uh, if you if you work for some type of prototyping shop this would be the first place i would go is to something like this to to design an object or at least a prototype object because one of the pieces and, and to kind of back up i've been in the cad cam k space now for around 30 years i'm an old man at this and so one of the pieces that you're, as a designer, a lot of times approached with, especially in the prototyping world, is you're given two objects in space or two points in space, um, three-dimensional space typically. And what you have to do is you have to join up with whatever you're designing um, those you know those coordinates in space for me my experience has been in code it's a far easier because in a graphical environment you first have to substantiate or instantiate those objects in space and then you have to draw your object with code uh, at least I do I sort of work backwards as I instantiate those objects or coordinates in space and then design my piece to fit. Yeah, uh, it, you know, once you kind of do it for a while, you kind of get the idea. And then you can also take that mesh outside of then the programmatic world into something like Fusion 360 and, and Doctor It Up and, and that kind of stuff. But also from a code perspective, when you move into the K world, the computer assisted engineering, uh, the code works far better because one of the things you can do with that model code or mesh is feed it into a finite element program, etc. So, anyways, tons of reasons, you know, uh, for using this type of. Um, mechanism for 3D printing, especially if you're looking at this commercially prototyping job shop, huge. Enough of the, the ramble. Let's get into this a little bit more. So what I've done is I've come up with a couple programming examples I'm going to share with you. The first one we're going to start with is Hello World. So one of the things before we get into that I want to point out is with View, notice here it says execute script automatically. I'm going to turn that off and I'm going to toggle that because um, it gets kind of annoying. And, and again, this is kind of a little tip. So I'm just going to go ahead and clear this out. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put our Hello World program. Okay, so we now have our Hello World program. Pretty simple. Uh, we just have a comment up here, which is just a comment. Uh, start Hello World. We have one line of code. And I'm just saying this is the end of the code. So what I'm going to do is go ahead. I'm going to toggle script back on. And there we go. We have a 10 millimeter by 10 millimeter cube. Wow, exciting. But what I want to do is tear this apart a little bit to kind of show you how this works. So the first thing we do is we have the cube, which is a primitive, and it works very much like OpenSCAD. So you have your X, your Y, and your Z. Now to send the cube to the uh, plane here and to the, the viewing uh, window, where we can now slice it if we want, 
We have to admit it. Emit it. I'll spit it out, not omit it. Emit it uh, with an E. So pretty simple and straightforward code. Not hard. Let's try something a little bit more difficult. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to uh, just delete this, and I'm also going to turn my execute script off. And let's go ahead and try another example. OK, so we've entered this new one, um, which is basically star primitive is, is what I've called it. So we talk about cube, cylinder, and sphere. So some basic primitive shapes. And we have those on our plane over here. Now, one of the things to notice is notice the sphere is on the plane where the cube and the cylinder or cylinder and the cube are not. Now, this is rather interesting uh, because of the way that it handles objects. And so you kind of have to be aware of uh, how this actually works. So this is actually centering on the object. So it's working these sort of together. I'm not going to get into that deep detail right now, but just know this little uh, oddity exists. So I want to break this up a little bit more. So you notice we have, just like in the prior example, we have the cube and we have the emit, but we've now added the translate command. So again, very much like OpenSCAD, we can translate or change the location of an object. And again, it works X, Y, and Z for moving the object around the plane. So now, as you notice, what I've done is I've placed the cylinder at the center of the plane. I've moved up the cube by 20 millimeters, or actually down by 20 millimeters. Sorry, it's a negative. And then I've also translated the sphere up 20 millimeters in the Y axis. And so you see, uh, as I rotate this around, how it's set in the Y axis over here and we can move those around. Say we wanted to move this out 40, all we would do is do that, change 40, and you see we've shifted the cube down um, by another 20 millimeters. So very much like OpenSCAD. Now, the one thing I do want to point out is the asterisk, because what you're doing here is you're saying translate at cube or cube at this translated location, however you want to look at it syntactically. This is what you're doing. So you have to have the at sign. You can also compound the at sign too, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. All right, so this is a pretty simple example. Let's try a little bit harder one. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to uh, erase this, and I'm going to turn off my view again just for simplicity and go to the next example. Okay, so we've pasted in our new code. Again, this is a little bit more busy looking than the past two examples. So let's go ahead and turn on execute script automatically and boom. What do we have? Well, just as it says, a NEMA 17 mount. So I, I did this in kind of crude form. If I wanted to be more particular, I would have used a for loop to create the bolt openings, but I wanted to more so demonstrate how this works. Uh, rather than optimize the code. So let's start this out. So we're going to instantiate a couple primitives. So up here, we're going to instantiate a cube as a C, a cylinder as a B, and for bolt, and then uh, another cylinder is the opening. So the cylinder in the center is the opening. These over here are the bolts. Obviously, this uh, plane here is the cube. And what we did, which is really interesting, is you can combine objects using a union. Now, what's really interesting about this is we're going to take this object, uh, these objects, group them together as a union to make them one, and then what we're going to use is the difference command uh, to take them out of the cube. So up here we have C for cube, so notice we have the cube instantiated here in the difference command, and then we have the holes over here, which we created from the union. And bingo, we have a NEMA mount. So this is where a lot of the power, I hope you can see, can, starts really coming in from this. Uh, because you can, again, build a library. And this is exactly what I do. I have a library of code, code snippets. And I draw upon them in, 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 from a polymorphic standpoint. In other words, being polymorphic says I can instantiate multiple copies of one set of code. And so I treat them as polymorphic objects in that I create multiples. Now, your head might be spinning a little bit, so I don't want to go too much further. But one of the things I want to share is the, that's really the power of where this programming comes in. If you're a programmer, 
um, you kind of get the idea. And if you're not a programmer, it's really not that hard. You know, you should not be afraid of this. And that's a big part of my message here is this is actually more of a scripting language than it is a programming language. So you don't have to worry about memory and all this other kinds of weird stuff. That's all taken care of for you behind the scenes. So you're really just kind of creating geometric constructs when, when you do something in here. All right. So enough said about that. I'm going to go ahead and erase this and go with another example because you're probably saying, Joe, but what if I already have an STL file? What can I do with that? And I'm glad you asked. You're my straight man. So let's go ahead and let's delete this and then let's turn off, execute, and then go to our next example. Okay, so we got our next example. Really simple here. We're going to just load an STL and we're going to admit it to the view plane. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to click on Execute Script Automatically, and there's our STL. So from Drive T, it's loaded this STL file. Now, one of the things, um, <clears throat> this is sort of adapted from Linux, so it's a little bit particular about spaces and the names and things like that, <clears throat> because Linux really doesn't allow you to have spaces in the name like Windows does. Uh, so you kind of have to be aware of that if you're setting up for file structures. What I really think about neat about this is you can have an STL repository on a shared NAS drive, which is what Drive T is for me, is a shared NAS drive. And you can have a group of people working on something or a group of machines processing something, and you can pull from that NAS drive. Very, very powerful stuff. And you can do it programmatically. Now, again, what we're doing here is very simple. We're just loading this part. Now, I can go over here and I can apply all my slicing stuff to it and send the G code to machine print. All right, now you're saying, Joe, that's great, but so what I can do that in Cura? Well, let's take a look at what else we can do. So let's go ahead, and go ahead delete this code. I'm gonna turn off the scripting and let's go to our next example. All right, so we got our next example. Now, what we're going to do is we're basically gonna do the same thing as we have done before. Uh, and I'm going to turn on the uh, execute and now look at we we have two parts because we've instantiated the same part twice. So what we've done is we've actually loaded this into a mesh and we're instantiating that mesh and we can apply translate difference union all to that STL. So this is where it gets crazy powerful because we can take multiple STLs and we can provide we can um, you know, enact Boolean logic on all those STLs together. So we can make a very, very complex object from uh, basic STL components or, or mesh components. Very, very powerful stuff, folks. Um, so let's take a little bit deeper look at this. Um, so we've just translated, we've moved their location, but what if we want to do a little bit more? Well, let's go to our last example. I know you guys are getting a little long in the tooth here and listening to me ramble about this because I'm geeked out about it. Hopefully you guys will get geeked out about it, even if you got to think about it for a half hour or so. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to delete this one. And again, turn this off so it doesn't... Uh... Okay, so we're back. So we, we have our last example here. And what I want to demonstrate is, again, very similar to the last example. I'm going to go ahead and turn it on. Is I'm going to execute script automatically. And now notice we've turned this piece around. And this is because we've applied the rotate command. Now, with the rotate command, what I wanted to demonstrate here is notice we have translate, uh, the uh, asterisk, and then we have rotate, and then we have our mesh. So we've now applied... Uh, multi-dimensional positioning to our uh, STL file. As I have mentioned, we can also do difference and union and scale and, and the whole litany of commands. And again, I'll have a lit, um, you know, the uh, reference to the command page a bit in the description below, so you can see it. So again, th this is very powerful because you know, again, if we want to rotate it. In, in the y-axis by 90 degrees, all I have to do is say 90, and boom, it's rotated by 90. And again, where this becomes very powerful is you can work up some basic algorithms to do optimal part placement on a bed. So say you have a 3D printing service that you want to get the you know most optimal tool path out of your job this is the way to do it because this is the one thing for most part with 3d printers is 3d 
folks in the 3D printing world, don't think too much about tool paths. When you work in C and C especially, you really, really have to think about your tool path. In other words, the direction and path which your tool moves, because you can you can end up with a 16-hour job that you can compress down to three hours if you optimize the tool path. And that's what ISSL really allows one to do is move that tool path. Now, since it's since a CNC is subtractive and this is additive, it, it's far more forgiving. Additive is far more forgiving. But if you really set this up so you optimize your tool paths, extruding, uh, your retractions, and that whole litany of, of controls which are allowed in the slicer in combination with the placement of parts, this is a very powerful tool, especially for complex parts. And I'll cover this a little bit more in some future episodes with this in this sort of tutorial series I'm doing on ISSL. But anyways, for right now, I just kind of wanted to share these, uh, you know, basic scripting modules with you and kind of very basically what you can do uh, with uh, ISSL Forge. So I'll have these code examples also out on the website on the DIY3dtech.com uh, site. Uh, so if you go out there after you see this posted, you can pick them up off the website. I also should have a link below um, uh, to them on the YouTube channel. It might be a little bit, a couple hour delay because um, it get automatically gets populated to the website and it's got automatically has to populate to get the URL and then I'll put the URL in manually if you care. So anyways, enough said. Uh, hopefully you found this interesting. If you did, give it a big thumbs up. If you got questions, you know, always hit me up in the comments below. Also, don't forget Swag Shop up there. Holiday season's coming. Some great deals out there for you, the loved ones. You know, show that you're a maker. And, hey, subscribe button. If you're not a subscriber, a lot of you guys aren't. You stumble across this. 80% of my viewership is not subscribed. So hit that subscribe button. Also hit the bell for notifications when I put out new videos. I've been doing this for three years with new videos um, several times a week. So hit me up, and we'll see you guys in the next video. Cheers. Please click like below and subscribe to the channel to keep up with the latest videos.